We're here today to talk to Jim Wilson, who's our new operating partner at Costa Noa, and we're thrilled to have him here. Tell us what you think are your top priorities and what you think you can bring to the Costa Noa portfolio. The simplest way I could describe it is that I'm a subject matter domain expert around sales for early stage companies. Now, what that translates to in terms of my priorities are really three. First, I'm hoping to tap into my network of buyers to help early stage companies have the critical conversations as they develop product market fit and go to market with their tools. Uh, second, uh, we talked a lot about hiring key people. I'm hoping to help them not only leverage my network, but develop their own criteria for hiring those key first salespeople, uh, their first key sales leaders, and giving them my insights, whether it be through the interview process or from creating that criteria for recruiting. And then third is that big topic of sales best practices. Um, I'm hoping to develop a list of consultants that they can tap into, as well as running a series of workshops on topics that I know are near and dear to me, but also that I hear about in other portfolio companies that aren't being talked about. We often work with founders who have right. built first product, they are, they've got it into market, they've maybe sold a few of them themselves, and they think, now I just need to hire a VP of sales. Right. What do you recommend they do next? Well, first, there's no right or wrong answer. There's guideposts, I think, with some best practices. So first, what I would tell founders is make sure you understand your business and the profile of the person that you want to hire. It might be someone that is used to selling to business. It might be someone used to selling to IT. Uh, Make sure to recognize the space that you're in and decide if you think it's really important that that person have some domain expertise in this space or you just want to hire generally a best athlete. And then finally, I would really caution founders on leap, making that leap to a VP of sales. Oftentimes, and I think you wrote about it in an earlier blog, the best thing to do is to just hire a few sales folks that meet your criteria and, and wait until you've got to a point where you can truly scale and that's when you successfully bring on a VP of sales. So what's the single best way of, of knowing that you're ready to scale? Look, I think that you know when you're ready to scale in a couple of ways. One, uh, from a metric standpoint, look at how your salespeople are doing and how they're performing. If you feel comfortable that the, num the right number and as a benchmark 70% or higher are hitting their goals, I think that's a good indicator. I think secondarily, the sales cycle and actually measuring the sales cycle um, and making sure that you have an accurate amount of information on that is a second indicator. Probably my best advice in this area though is to make it a data-driven decision. It's very easy, and I've fallen victim to this as well, to make it based on intuition and hunches, but it's probably the single biggest thing that should be data-driven is making that decision to scale up. You've got this creative tension between wanting to set quotas in a way that are aspirational and sure, high, sure. and on the other hand, you want a certain number of people or a percentage of people to actually hit their numbers. How do you think about what's the right amount of stretch yes. to have in quota assignment? Great. I mean, look, it's simple to give you a, a benchmark number of 70%, but I think if you look at and take a step back to what the way a salesperson's mind thinks, he wants to know that the executives have taken as much guesswork out of that process as possible. So as much as possible, if it can be a data-driven exercise to come up with quotas that can then be explained to everybody in the sales organization, that's what salespeople want to hear. Uh, what they don't want to hear is that it's so aspirational and that they've just kind of made up that number and they're going to reach for the stars. They want to hear that it's based on historical growth rates uh, and they want to know a reason why we've come up with the math behind those growth rates. I think once you present that to reasonable salespeople that know that they're an early stage company, they'll be all in and it'll work in your favor, whether they make their quotas or not. One of the challenges in early stage companies can be keeping sales and marketing in alignment. And I know you and I have talked a great deal about how important that is. Uh, what are the best practices to ensure that sales and marketing are in alignment and working productively together? Well, uh, again, it's one of these things that falls into the no right answer, but a lot of best practices. Um, I think the first thing is the two executives just have to be on the same page and have to constantly be updating each other and understanding what, you, what, what each other's roles are. Second, I think that for at least for salespeople, especially in an early stage company, they've got to understand that there's going to be some experimentation. 
So on the marketing side around messaging and product market fit, they're going to tweak things and the sales executives or the first salespeople need to be comfortable with pivoting occasionally. And then finally, from a marketing standpoint, I really think a best practice is listening to the feedback from the sales organization. They really are the conduit out to those prospects and customers um, and their feedback is valuable. So Jim, you've obviously had a bunch of experience in really early stage companies and then scaling them till they get much bigger. At Merced, up to $70 million. At Sumo Logic, uh, from four to over $40 million in ARR. Why did you decide to come back to the very early stage? You know, the thing that I think about when I look at the experiences I've had in sales, and by the way, I think of my experiences both best and worst practices, hits and misses, and you learn from both. But it, the hardest part of building a company is in that early stage. I think of these folks as builders. You know, we talk about operators and founders, but a lot of times they're builders, whether it be product, process, brand of the company, or building the sales organization. I think it's the hardest part. I also think it's the least understood of the whole cycle of a startup. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing when you nail it early on. And frankly, it's pretty ugly when you don't. And so I wanted to insert myself in a place where I thought I could add the most value. And to me, those early stage startups is where I think I can add the most value. And I think it's frankly where Cosanoa's mission and what they actively do adds the most value as well. I love the breadth of all the portfolio companies. I love the focus on early stage builders and helping early stage founders really build the, the key infrastructure of their companies. And I'm looking forward to making an impact and getting to work. Absolutely, you're doing it already. All Thanks right. very much, Thanks, great Greg. to have you here. Thank you.